time has come to start the performance. It's my uh, pleasure this morning to welcome you on behalf of the Law Society to the program on small business planning, which uh, has been arranged for today and tomorrow. The over-subscription uh, evidences the interest we all have in the matter. And uh, there isn't one of us that isn't aware that uh, these days you have to run like mad to just keep up. And uh, these uh, programs, we hope, the Law Society hopes, will be of assistance to all of us in uh, giving better service to our clients and uh, satisfaction to ourselves. The uh, program convener, the chairman of the arrangement committee, and your master of ceremonies in the program that lies ahead this morning is uh, Jack Ground. And uh, my few remaining words will just be to tell you a bit about him, although I'm sure it's no longer necessary to give an extended introduction to Jack. You saw, many of you saw him in operation as the chairman of the Arrangements Committee at the Midwinter meeting a few weeks ago. But uh, here are the statistics or the facts. After leaving university in the late 50s, he uh, entered practice and in 1968 he commenced his public uh, career in the sense that he took on a lecturing assignment in the Corporation Finance at the University of Toronto Law School. And uh, since then, he has become uh, a teaching instructor and uh, an assistant head of course, or joint head of course, and now is the head of course in the corporate and commercial law section of the bar admission course. His uh, credentials, his experience, and his attention to these matters is exemplary, and uh, the society is extremely fortunate that he's able to take further time away from his other many responsibilities, such as running ratepayers' organizations, I'm told, to uh, assist us in uh, you in this program this morning. Uh, in addition to these activities, on behalf of the Law Society, he, is, he has, as you know, been active in the work of the Bar Association and is the immediate past secretary of the Ontario uh, branch. My happy function is finished. I, Happy to see you here. I trust it will be a satisfactory and enjoyable occasion. And I'll now turn over the meeting to, uh, to Jack Ground. Well, thank you, Stuart. You'll uh, be happy to know I haven't much to say. Um, first of all, I thought I might just run through the format of the program. For those of you who did not bring your yellow seven for spring thing with you, uh, we're starting this morning with a lecture by Donald Cameron on the form and organization of the business entity, followed by a coffee break, and then by a lecture on tax considerations by Ron Appleby. From 11 till 12.30 is a group discussion. From 12.30 till 2, the luncheon. There will be a bar available. Uh, those of you who decide not to partake of the bar before lunch, it would be a help to us if you could go right down to the cafeteria and get yourselves fed. We're going to have a bit of a problem with numbers in the cafeteria. Then at two will be Paul Moore's lecture on financing, followed by another seminar from three to 4.30. Tomorrow morning we start again at nine, the first lecture being on industrial property by David Rogers, followed by a coffee break, and then a lecture on banking and commercial law by David Key. And that will be followed by an hour and a half discussion group from 11 to 12.30 and then lunch. Now, you will have all received in the mail with your confirmation of registration a resume of the lectures, which is really just a selling piece to entice you to come, together with a fact situation. And uh, the idea is that the fact situation will be the basis for the group discussions throughout today and tomorrow. And hopefully the fact situation will bring out problems raised in the various lectures and in the various uh, written papers. The idea is that the fact situation will be 
sort of a continuing saga like Mary Worth or the Bunkers or whatever you want. Now, if anyone has forgotten to bring the uh, fact situation with them, there are extra copies available and your group instructors will have them. You also should have picked up this morning the uh, volume which contains four of the five papers. We're unfortunately running a bit behind in printing and uh, David Rogers' paper on industrial property will be printed separately, hopefully will be available before the end of today. I would like to, <clears throat> just before introducing Donald Cameron, to <clears throat> excuse me, give credit where credit is due and uh, thank the members of the planning committee. They're the people who really do the work in organizing these things and get none of the glory. The uh, planning committee for this particular program was Gordon Coleman, Alan Carp, David Gordon, and Ted Torrey, and I would like to thank them for all the work they did. My one remaining task this morning is to introduce Donald Cameron. Don is a graduate from the University of Toronto in Modern History and from the University of Toronto Law School in 1961. He was called to the bar in April of 63 and since that time has been practicing with the firm of Lash, Johnson, Sheard and Pringle. Don has been a bar admission course instructor since 1967, which certainly shows great tenacity or, or something, I'm not sure what. And uh, as far as the small businessman is concerned, uh, Don certainly knows whereof he speaks. When uh, we were at university together, Don for a number of years was in charge of the sock department at Frank Stallry's menswear. I'll now call on Donald Cameron. Ladies and gentlemen, perhaps the best way to start this series of lectures is at the end. Your client will retain you to advise him on what sort of a business entity he should have to assist him in the organization of that entity and to advise and assist in the commencement of business by that entity. He will be, expect and be entitled to receive on the conclusion of your services your opinion to the effect that Firstly, the business entity has been duly and validly organized in accordance with and is in good standing under all applicable laws. And two, the business entity has a good and marketable title to the assets and business which it acquired, and that such assets are held and business is carried on in compliance with all applicable laws. The index to my paper should give you some idea of the comprehensive nature of its contents. In the time available to us this morning, I would like to concentrate on three areas. First of all, the reasons for incorporation, as opposed to partnership or limited partnership or sole proprietorship. Secondly, the form of application for uh, incorporation under the Business Corporations Act. And thirdly, the acquisition of assets. Firstly, the reasons for incorporation. Limited liability, of course, is the one that comes to mind first to anyone. Partners are liable to the full extent of their personal assets for partnership liabilities. However, a corporation is an entity separate and distinct from its shareholders. The shareholders are liable only for the amount they have subscribed or agreed to subscribe for the shares to be taken by them. If your client is going to carry on business in a manner which could result in an uninsurable hazards, or if there is some possibility of loss or of failure of the business, his exposure as a shareholder of the corporation is limited to his investment in the shares of the corporation. His personal assets are not exigible to satisfy a corporate debt. However, any personal guarantee by a shareholder of the corporation's liabilities could expose his personal assets to the extent of the amount guaranteed. You must then look at the number and relationship of the proposed proprietors of the business. If there are a large number of proprietors, or others are to be added later, or if the proposed proprietors are not already close and trusting business associates, incorporation offers established and accepted rules for control, operating procedures, investors' rights, limited liability, and flexibility of financing. 
A corporation offers far greater degrees of participation in risk. Partners are agent, agents for the others and jointly liable for all partnership debts. And the only normal variable will be their respective shares in the profits or losses as general partners. In limited partnerships, there may be one or more other partners who is a limited partner, but his liability is limited to the amount he has agreed to invest, and he is not entitled to participate in management. The corporation offers a much wider variety of investment and risk options for the proposed proprietors. The common shareholder risks his investment, plus any guarantees, and stands to gain any profits. Various classes of preferred shareholders, who by the terms attaching to the preferred shares could be virtually on a par with the common shareholders, or by use of preferences on repayment of capital with a premium, high preferred dividends, cumulative dividends, voting rights, sinking funds, conversion rights, and veto rights on new capital, could have the safety and security of a lender with or without some or all of the benefits accruing to a common shareholder. You must also look to the borrowing requirements in the available terms. Borrowing by partnerships is normally, normally fairly unsophisticated. Promissory notes, unsecured or secured by a general assignment of book debts, uh, pledge of inventory or, or receivables or securities, chattel mortgages and re uh, realty mortgages. Lenders normally require incorporation before considering more sophisticated financing like bonds, which are secured with both a fixed charge and a floating charge, or debentures, which may be secured by a floating charge or totally unsecured, trustees providing for a trustee to represent a number of lenders, complex provisions for sinking funds, restricting the giving of security on additional borrowing, or restricting the payment of excess profits to proprietors while the loans are outstanding. Indeed, a lender may insist on incorporation as only its directors and officers can act for it, and not just any of the proprietors. Incorporation is the only way an institutional lender will lend if it wants an equity position or a right to acquire equity. If borrowings are to be from a non-arm's length foreigner, partnership may be preferable. Interest on borrowings in excess of three times the equity of a corporation is not deductible from income as an expense, but such thin capitalization rules do not apply to partnerships. Some government grants and loans are available only to corporations. These include uh, the Industrial Design Assistance Program, the Program for the Advancement of Industrial Technology, the Program to Enhance Productivity, and the Ontario Development Corporation Loans. These are all government programs designed to achieve the objectives for which they were set up, to encourage uh, research and development, to encourage productivity. You should then look at the kind of income anticipated in order to determine whether incorporation is what you want. Profits of corporations in Ontario are now taxed at a rate of 51%. That is, a federal tax of 49%, less the 10% provincial tax credit, plus the 12% Ontario tax. This rate will reduce to 48% by 1976. These rates, of course, are subject to the provisions relating to, the, uh, to active business income of private Canadian corporations and the announced lower rates on profits from manufacturing and processing operations. Dividends paid by the corporation from after-tax profits to shareholders result in the net profits of the corporation being taxed again in the hands of the shareholders, subject to the dividend tax credit provisions. The dividend tax credit provisions require that uh, you include in the income of the shareholder uh, four-thirds of the, the amount of the dividend. And it, it, he is then permitted to deduct from federal and in provincial taxes otherwise payable an amount equal to approximately 35% of the dividend actually paid. There are lower rates of tax on income from active businesses carried on by Canadian-controlled private corporations. Now, rental and investment income, income from adventure in the nature of trade, and capital gains are not active business income. In order to qualify as active business income, the nature of the business must be trading, manufacturing, processing, fabricating, servicing, transportation, financial, 
commercial, logging, farming, fishing, or construction. And there must be a significant volume of ordinary business transactions in relation to the type of business carried on. The first $50,000 of active business income in a year is taxed at 25%, rather than at the general corporate rate of about 50%, until the corporation has earned its cumulative limit of $400,000 of active business income. The limit is reduced by the amount of dividends paid out of the income tax at the lower rate. <coughs> the government has announced reduced rates of tax for manufacturing and processing profits of corporations. These would uh, reduce the rates uh, from 50% to 40% and from 25% to 20%, depending on which category the corporation was in. Canadian investment income, uh, being taxable capital gains from sources in Canada, income from property in Canada, other than exempt income and dividends from taxable Canadian corporation, and non-active business income is taxed in the hands of a corporation at the 50% rate. However, when a private corporation pays a dividend out of investment income, it will receive a refund of $1 for every $3 of dividends paid. The effective rate on, of tax on the corporation is thus 25%. A shareholder receiving the dividend would apply the dividend tax credit and the total taxes paid would then be the same as if there was no intervening corporation. That is full integration. However, by having an intervening corporation, payment of part of the tax is postponed. If the shareholder's other income is taxed at a marginal rate in excess of the tax rate of the corporation, You want to look at the amount of income and the possibility of losses and failures. If losses are likely to result and the business is not incorporated, the proprietor can deduct the losses from his other income. If the business is incorporated, the loss is that of the corporation and is only deductible from the profits, if any, of the corporation in the preceding year and the five following years. Capital losses of a corporation can only be deducted from its capital gains. An individual can deduct up to $1,000 of capital losses per year ad infinitum from future ordinary income. Capital cost allowance claimed by a taxpayer in respect of rental real estate cannot exceed his income from renting or leasing and so is not available to reduce his other income. However, a corporation whose principal business is the leasing, rental, development, or sale of real property owned by it is not subject to this restriction and can use such capital cost allowance to reduce its income from other sources. Incorporation will permit the stabilization of fluctuating income. Partners receive annually their shares of the profits, which can bring swing drastically from year to year. A shareholder employee can draw a fixed salary from his company, which is, to the extent that it is reasonable, an expense to the company. He can then leave some of the profits in the company for expansion, future dividends, which are not deductible as an expense of the company, or are reserved to pay his salary in bad years. A collateral advantage is that he can avoid the escalating marginal rates of tax on individuals by not taking out all the profits in successful years. There are some estate planning advantages to incorporation. Firstly, uh, you might consider freezing the taxable value of a father's interest on death at its present value and permitting growth of the business to inure to his son free of capital gains or succession duties on father's death by giving the son one common share for a nominal value and the father taking back a note or preferred shares with a par value in exchange for the assets of his business transferred to the corporation. I should warn you that there are hazards which should be very carefully considered before embarking on such a plan. A second estate planning advantage would be the passing on of an interest in the business to one or more legatees who will not take part in the operation of the business. Uh, this is best done by shares of a corporation. The desirability of perpetual existence. If the venture is for a limited time only, partnership may be preferable. However, a partnership may have to dissolve to pay a deceased partner's share to his estate or to pay a retiring partner's interest to the retiring partner unless there is a buy-sell provision in the agreement. If 
it's a corporation, the shares would be more readily marketable or distributable than a partnership interest, and there would be no loss of cash to the corporation. Unless there are provisions to the contrary in the partnership agreement, death or a minor difference of opinion provoking a notice to dissolve could result in dissolution, and it would be necessary to renegotiate major contracts, file notices of dissolution, a new declaration of partnership, enter a new partnership agreement, provide for new bank signing authorities, and so on. The dislocation of the business on the death of a sole proprietor is even more serious. A corporation continues notwithstanding the death or withdrawal of a shareholder or a director, and the remaining directors carry on the business. In determining whether or not to incorporate, you should consider whether there are any benefits to be derived uh, if it's your desire to give the employees a share in the growth of the business and in the profits of the business without the management rights of a partner. And perhaps also, and this is often overlooked, incorporation may be just a little too sophisticated for your client. Or conversely, your client may just wish the prestige of incorporation. I'd ask you now to turn to the annotated articles of incorporation at page A101 of my lecture. I'd like to make just a few general comments on this application for incorporation. Uh, I think these are the problems that everyone must consider every time he files an application for incorporation, and they are very common problems. Firstly, the name. It's becoming increasingly difficult to obtain a name acceptable to the department, and you should apply by letter to the department for a name search and clearance to ensure that the name is not so similar to that of another person or business as to be likely to deceive or that it is otherwise objectionable. Now, the departments take the attitude that trademarks are the equivalent of, an, of a business name. In your application for an Ontario corporation, the Ontario authorities will not do a trademark search. That's up to you to search. However, the federal department will if uh, on reading the application, they feel that there's a good probability that a registered trademark uh, would have a similar name. If the company is to carry on business in another jurisdiction, its name should also be cleared in that jurisdiction to ensure that registration or extra-provincial licensing will not be denied on the grounds of a conflicting name. I can tell you from personal experience, I have had that problem in Ontario. The name was quite acceptable to the authorities of another province which incorporated the company. But when we tried to register the company as an extra-provincial company in, in Ontario, the registration was refused because it conflicted with the name of a company already incorporated in Ontario or with a partnership uh, or proprietorship whose name had been registered. A name conflicting with that of another business, person, or trademark would result in a change of name by the minister, or indeed even in a passing off action. The name must include a distinctive word and must not be inconsistent with the principal objects of the company. It may have to include a word indicating the principal objects, such as sales, manufacturing, investments, etc. If the absence of such descriptive word could result in confusion with another person or business. Before submitting any non-number name, you should review the applicable statutory and regulatory requirements so that you're not obviously off base in the use of restricted or prohibited words or in the statutory requirements. You must also attach to the articles or application for incorporation the necessary consents and undertakings of any individual, partnership, or company with similar names. A corporation with a similar name, which will not be a parent, may be required to undertake to change its name or dissolve. When a suitable name is available, if you are not incorporating immediately, you should by letter and the payment of $5 to the provincial department reserve the name for a period of 90 days. Where there is no need for a distinctive name and a satisfactory name is not available, there is provision in the Ontario Act for a number name 
which must be followed by Ontario and by Limited LTD Incorporated Inc. Corporation or Corp. You cannot choose the number, but delay in incorporation because of an existing similar name can be avoided. Merely leave the first space in the name in your application blank and request your letter enclosing the articles in the registration fee that the department assign a number. Now the directors. An Ontario company not offering its securities to the public may have as few as one director, while a public offering company must have three, of whom two are not officers or employees of the company. No director need be a shareholder, and the president need not be a director, if the bylaws so permit. Thus, where there, is only, where there are only one or two shareholders, there is no need to get others involved as directors in the operation of the company. Directors in Ontario must be 18 years of age. After October the 1st of this year, a majority of the directors of an Ontario company must be Canadian citizens ordinarily resident in Canada. A majority of the meetings of the directors and the executive committee of an Ontario company in any fiscal year must be held in Canada. As yet, there are no such restrictions on federal companies, but the federal government has announced its intention to introduce amendments to the Canada Corporations Act to an effect similar to that of the Ontario Act. The written consent of directors of an Ontario corporation who are not applicants for incorporation must be filed with the articles. Subsequent, subsequent directors must be present at the meeting at which they are elected or consent in writing to be directors within 10 days after their election, otherwise their election is void. The objects of the company. The objects of the corporation must be within the legislative jurisdiction of the jurisdiction to which you are applying for a cor incorporation. Or to put it more simply, don't try to apply to the federal government for educational objects. The British North America Act says that that is within the legislative jurisdiction of the provinces. The corporation's object should be drafted in the infinitive form of the verb and kept broad for future flexibility and brief as the implied powers and ancillary objects contained in both statutes are quite comprehensive. Do not include any of such ancillary objects uh, in your articles. It is generally conceded that the doctrine of ultra vires no longer exists, but if an Ontario corporation acts beyond its powers, such lack of capacity may be asserted in proceedings by shareholders against the company or its directors or by the minister as cause for cancellation of the certificate of incorporation. Broad objects will limit this exposure. If the corporation intends to acquire realty in excess of that to be actually used to carry on its business, power to do so should be inserted in the articles of an Ontario corporation. Provisos limiting the powers should be omitted unless they exclude one or more of the incidental or ancillary powers contained in the Act. Capitalization. I don't, won't dwell on this in any detail, and we'll leave uh, more of this up to uh, Mr. Moore in his lecture. But let me just say this. There must be one class of common shares in an Ontario company, which are voting in all the circumstances. However, none need be issued but be aware of the practical consequences. You may, but are not obliged, to have other classes of shares, either preferred or deferred, which in the Ontario Act are known as special shares. These may, there may be as many classes of special shares and series within each class of special shares as are necessary to the company's financing requirements. Each series of shares in a class must have the same voting rights, but otherwise each series within the class may have different provisions. You must decide on the number of classes of shares there will be and the attributes of each of these classes with respect to voting or non-voting and contingencies giving rise to a vote, the right to elect one or more directors, preferences as to dividends, the amount of dividends, whether the dividends are cumulative or non-cumulative, preference as to repayment of capital on winding up, provisions as to purchase for cancellation or redemption by the company, and the calculation of the price to be paid on such uh, 
cancellation or purchase, sinking funds provisions, rights of conversion into other sh classes of shares, and provisions for less than unanimous consent to amend the share conditions or to create shares in priority. There should be sufficient shares of each class authorized to satisfy both immediate and anticipated needs of the company. Restrictions on transfer. If the company's shares are not to be offered to the public, are restrictions on transfer to be attached to the allotment issue or transfer of the shares? For instance, are there to be preemptive rights, giving the existing shareholders a right of first refusal of any further shares to be issued from the treasury of the company? Or must all transfers uh, be subject to a resolution of the directors or a resolution of the shareholders? The Securities Act of Ontario provides in Section 19 an exemption from the registration requirements for trading in Section 6 and the prospectus requirements of Section 35 for the securities of a private company. Now, a private company is defined in that Act uh, in a similar way to its definition in the Canada Corporations Act. Briefly, that it has a restriction on the transfer of its shares, that it has a maximum of 50 shareholders, and there is a prohibition on the issuance of its securities to the public. The proposed new Securities Act, presently known as Bill 154, contains a similar exemption for private companies from the requirements for registration and for filing a cornerstone statement and offering circular. Unless and until such exemption is changed, it would be advisable to consider including in the Articles of Incorporation provisions making the corporation a private company to enable trading of its securities without having to comply with the owner's provisions of the Securities Act. However, such securities may not be issued by the company to the public without violating the private company restrictions. You will note that the restriction to transfer goes in item 9 of the BCA application, while the other two private company restrictions go in item 9A. Borrowing powers. If the corporation intends to carry on business in Quebec and borrow on the security of property in that province, include in the incorporating document the corporation's power to borrow to comply with the Special Corporate Powers Act of Quebec. If not, borrowing can be authorized by special bylaw. Purchase of issued shares. An Ontario company, if it's authorized by its articles, may purchase its issued common shares and, subject to its articles, resell them. The incorporators should, but need not, take any shares in the capital of the corporation following its incorporation. If no shares are issued and all the directors die, I would think the corporation's assets would have to escheat to the Crown. An Ontario company may not issue shares for less than the amount to be paid up, to be paid for those shares. Nor may they issue shares for a document evidencing the indebtedness of the LOT, for instance, a promissory note. The applicants for incorporation of an Ontario corporation may be one or more persons, or indeed one or more companies. The natural persons must be over 18 years of age. Both departments are prepared, that is both the federal and provincial department, are prepared to consider draft articles or applications for incorporation and review their contents prior to their execution and the formal submission. In connection with filing your application, you should submit your articles executed in duplicate by delivery of a letter with the requisite fee. The minimum fee is, the fees are set out in the regulations to the Business Corporations Act. The minimum fee, of course, is $125 for $40,000 of authorized capital. The department will then do a name search, but not of trademarks, as I indicated earlier, to ensure that there is no conflicting name and obtain any necessary approval from another government department. For example, articles for hospitals, ambulance companies, and timber slide companies will be subject to approval by another department. In connection with a pharmacy, ensure that the pharmacy will have pharmacists constituting a majority of its directors and that the pharmacists hold a majority of its shares. 
as required by the Pharmacy Act. And corporations for real estate brokers and insurance agents should be first approved by the Registrar of Real Estate and business brokers or the Superintendent of Insurance to ensure that licenses will be granted on incorporation. These departments have very definite ideas on the name and objects of corporations under their jurisdiction, and the company's branch will ensure that such approval will be granted before filing the articles. The application is further checked by the provincial department to merely ensure that the articles, quotes, conform to law, close quotes. Once approved, the department will then attach a one-page document to the duplicate filed by you called a Certificate of Incorporation bearing the date on which the corporation comes into existence and return it to you. The other copy is filed with the department. Unless you request a later date, the date of filing the articles, that is, incorporation, the date of incorporation, will be the date the articles or application are received by the department unless there is a prolonged delay for substantial changes. I'd like to spend the remainder of my time now considering the acquisition of a business and some of the major points you should look at. <clears throat> Your first decision, of course, is going to be, will you be acquiring shares or assets? That is, the shares of a company or the assets owned by a company whose shares you might be considering purchasing. The decision is a complex one which requires the participation of you and the auditors to consider the tax corporate and conveyancing differences between the two methods. In a share purchase, you acquire not only the assets, but also the liabilities of the company, which are often unknown and unwanted. However, only the shares need be assigned, and you need not be concerned with the assignment and registration of each individual asset and contract. However, the values and titles to each of the underlying assets and extent of each of the underlying liabilities, the status of underlying contracts, and the status of the corporation, its business and tax position, must all be considered. Securities Act provisions for the registration and prospectus requirements must also be considered. In an asset purchase, the purchaser can ascertain what assets he is acquiring and select the liabilities, if any, he is prepared to assume but the convey conveyancing is more complex. Valuation of and title to each asset and the status of each contract must be considered and confirmed, and each asset transferred by an appropriate document, which may have to be registered. You must consider retail sales tax, land transfer tax, compliance with the Bulk Sales Act, and terminations of employment. Tax considerations will include the existence of a loss carry forward in the company carrying on the business the availability of the small business deduction, the desire of the purchaser to step up asset values or allocate values to goodwill, the creation of designated surplus, the cost of the underlying assets, and the rollover exemptions from the realization of capital gains, the possibility of an assessment under Section 247.2 of the Income Tax Act, and the existence of pre-1972 undistributed income on hand and capital surplus. Now, you should look at the financial statements of the company that owns these assets before you make your decision. Get the latest audited balance sheet and statement of profit and loss, together with the latest tax statements, which should be obtained, to determine the nature of the assets and liabilities being acquired and their values for the purpose of determining conveyancing problems, the purchase price, and tax problems. Depreciable assets will be shown on the statements the lower of cost or undepreciated capital cost at the indicated rate. Non-depreciable assets will be shown normally at the lower of cost or market, and there should be an allowance shown for bad debts. There may have to be an appraisal of some assets, such as land, securities, or inventories. The statements will also give you a better understanding of the business and raise questions as to various other matters, such as contracts, licenses, consents, etc., that will have to be dealt with in the purchase agreement. We'll assume for our purposes today that the transaction will be an asset purchase. However, in considering an asset purchase, we do get into the problem of purchasing shares if one of the assets you're purchasing is the shares of a wholly owned subsidiary or of portfolio investments. First of all, look at the purchaser's objects and powers. 
If an interest in land, including a lease, is being acquired by a federal company, it must first obtain either a general or specific license in Mort, Maine under the Mort, Maine and Charitable Uses Act. If a business carried on in a jurisdiction outside Ontario and Quebec is being acquired by the company, it must obtain an extra-provincial license or register as an extra-provincial company in such jurisdiction. If the purchaser is a proprietorship or partnership, it may have to register in such jurisdiction. Consider the method of payment. The purchaser may have sufficient cash to pay the purchase price. It might obtain further equity capital by issuing shares or pay for the assets by issuing shares to the vendor. It might borrow either from an outsider or from the vendor by way of payment of the purchase price in installments. The lender may accept a simple promissory note as security for the loan or the balance owing on the purchase price. Or the lender vendor may require a charge or mortgage, chattel mortgage, assignment of accounts receivable, a pledge of securities or other assets, a bond, a debenture, and so on. The lender is going to require certain positive covenants by the purchasing company that it will do certain things in, in the way it carries on its business. And it will also require certain negative covenants, restricting the purchaser, containing such limitations, uh, on, uh, as limitations on future capital commitments, uh, payment of dividends, or borrowing until the loan is paid. The lender may require a guarantee from a major shareholder, with or without security from the guarantor. That security may take the form of, of a pledge of securities or pledge of shares or a mortgage of some property owned by the guarantor. If payment is to be made by or if equity capital is to be issued, you should ensure that there is sufficient authorized unissued equity shares in the capital of the company to satisfy such requirements. If debt securities are to be issued, there must be a valid borrowing bylaw and the creation and issue of the securities by the directors of the purchaser. If the payment is by cash, consider providing in the agreement for a holdback as security for the vendor's representations and warranties. There are certain Securities Act considerations which you should look at to determine whether or not uh, the issue of any securities by the purchaser will constitute a trade. They obviously will, but will they be a distribution to the public? If investment or portfolio securities are included in the assets being purchased and their sale to the purchaser will be a distribution to the public, you must inquire into the circumstances of the vendor's acquisition of the securities and whether they are sufficient to materially affect control of the issuer. Exemptions from registration and a prospectus may be available, or it may be necessary to obtain a Section 59 ruling under the Securities Act. Director's conflict of interest. I want to very strongly emphasize the importance of careful consideration in this area, which is all too often overlooked, and which results in tremendous expense to a client and very substantial embarrassment to the solicitor. This is the situation where a director has an interest, either direct or indirect, in a contract or proposed contract, or indeed any other transaction, with the company which is in conflict with his duty as a director of the company. Both acts, both the Canada Corporations Act and the Business Corporations Act, make specific provision for such an event. And these statutory provisions should be followed carefully to avoid the contract being declared void and the director being made accountable to the company for any profit on the transaction. The sections have some differences, but both statutes require the director to promptly declare his interest and refrain from voting on the contract. The Ontario Act requires disclosure of the cost of an asset being sold to the company within a certain period after its acquisition by the vendor. If there is not a quorum of disinterested directors to approve the contract, a meeting of shareholders should be called to confirm the contract by the requisite majority. The notice calling the meeting should give particulars of the transaction 
and the director's conflict in reasonable detail to enable the shareholders to decide how to vote, knowing all the material facts. Note that shareholder approval under the Ontario Act does not constitute a whitewash. The director will still be accountable for any profit if he was not acting honestly and in good faith. And the contract will still be voidable if it was not in the best interests of the company at the time it was entered into. The leading case in this area is Garvey and Axsmith in the 1962 Ontario Reports. Uh, in reading that, you should read it subject to the new provisions in the Business Corporations Act, which are somewhat different than the provisions existing in the Ontario Corporations Act at the time that case was decided. Further questions which you want to consider on the acquisition of a business are uh, the problem of any requisite business licenses, either under a, a municipal uh, licensing bylaw or under provincial legislation. You want to consider sales tax permits. If you're acquiring inventory or if the business will be one where the purchaser will be purchasing goods for resale, get a vendor's permit under Section 3 of the regulations of the Retail Sales Tax Act and you can then obtain uh, the exemptions in, in Sections 38 and 39 of Section 5 of the Act. You may want to consider the, necessar the necessity for a federal sales tax certificate if a manufacturing business is being acquired. Retail sales tax. The vendor must obtain from the Minister of Revenue and deliver to the purchaser a copy of the certificate under Section 4 of the Retail Sales Tax Act that all such taxes payable by the vendor have been paid. On closing, the purchaser must pay to the vendor or to the provincial treasury and provide evidence thereof to the vendor the 7% sales tax exigible under Section 2 of the Act. Some of the assets may be exempt from the tax under Section 5. The transaction may be exempt under Section 19 of the regulations. If there is a 95% common ownership of the vendor and purchaser, or one owns 95% of the other. The Bulk Sales Act. You must comply with the Bulk Sales Act on, a, on an asset transaction, either by obtaining an exemption under Section 3 or complying with the 10% deposit limit and statement of seller's creditors under Section 4. It may be necessary also to provide for the immediate payment of the seller's creditors as provided in Section 8, or indeed, if necessary, to comply with the provisions respecting the appointment of a trustee. Failure to comply with the Bulk Sales Act will result in the purchaser acquiring a title voidable at the instance of the vendor's creditors. If the purchaser is prepared to rely on the vendor's covenant in the agreement to pay all its liabilities, or is assuming the vendor's liabilities and is satisfied that there are no others, he may risk the failure to comply with the Act. You should also consider whether the consent of any security holders will be necessary. If the vendor is a corporation, uh, the shareholders should approve of the transaction. If, there, it's an on, if the vendor is an Ontario corporation, there should be a special resolution approving the sale of the, the business, if it constitutes substantially all of the undertaking of the company, that is the vendor company. If it's an, a Canadian corporation, the position isn't quite so clear, but good practice would dictate that the shareholders of a federal corporation approve the sale of the assets where substantially all of the undertaking of the company is being sold. Indeed, there may be uh, certain restrictions on, on security um, borrowings by the vendor that would require the consent of or releases from uh, secured lenders. One other point I would like to mention in connection uh, with the considerations you should uh, look at before completing the transaction, or before going through with the transaction, is the question of employees. The purchaser of assets should agree to hire all the employees on closing on their present terms and conditions, except those employees who are specifically excluded by the terms of the agreement. The vendor should then give notices or pay in lieu of notice 
as required under Part 2 of the Employment Standards Act and the regulations under that act. Now, the Employment Standards Act is only part of the law that you have to comply with. You must also comply with any contract of employment as to the notice required to dismiss an employee without cause. And in the absence of a contract of employment, of course, you must comply with the common law regarding reasonable notice. If there are more than 50 employees involved, you should give notice of the transaction and the termination of employment to the uh, Department of Labor at least eight weeks prior to the closing date. Now, the director under the Employment Standards Act may make a determination under Section 10 of that Act that the vendor and purchaser are a single employer, which will, in effect, exempt the vendor from compliance with the Act. If the purchaser is not hiring some of the vendor's employees, it is then the responsibility of the vendor to give any notice required under the Employment Standards Act, plus any additional notice which uh, the employee is entitled to under his in contract of employment or the common law. The purchaser will be a new employer and obliged to commence afresh non-refundable Canada Pension Plan payments, notwithstanding all the payments for the year have been made by the vendor prior to the sale. The employees will also have to make their CPP payments for the year anew, but any overpayment may be recovered on their income tax return for that year filed the following April. Finally, the purchase of a business, purchaser of a business becomes the continuing employer and is bound by the terms of a collective agreement under Section 55 of the Labor Relations Act. Well, I see our time is almost up. Perhaps the other matters for consideration could be left to the group instructors. Thank you very much.